Last time we covered the evolution of the Comblain rifle, as issued to Belgium's unique Garde Civique. This time we'll explore its role in the war, which also, curiously, may include the regular army. Hi, I'm Matthias, and this, oh, this little darling, is the Belgian Mousqueton Model 1871-83, a Comblain carbine that saw use not with the Garde Civique, but with the army. So let's go ahead and get a better look. With an overall length of 38.5 inches and with a weight of 6.4 pounds, this is a tidy single shot breech loading carbine. The cartridge is still 11 millimeter, however, that case length is now 42.5. It is still, however, rimmed. Last episode, we ran through the various iterations of the Comblain long rifle. In the summary, Brazil really liked tinkering with Comblains, but let's rewind that clock just a bit. This is the first official Belgian issued Comblain, the Phosphor Bronze Action long rifle issued to the Garde Civique. The army, however, was using the Albini Braidlin and less so the Tursen conversion rifles. As we covered last time, Comblain ammunition developed from the 11mm Albini Braidlin round, eventually taking on its own features, but remaining largely compatible. The Belgian cavalry would move up to the Tursen carbine, a conversion of the old 1848 Theovenin percussion rifle. These guns are very rare today, as is information on them, which is likely because another contender would soon enter the market. Our man Comblain, and more likely his business partners Lambin et Thiet. Well, they managed to get some military trials of their new rifle, but just a bit shorter. Now, when looking to replace the cavalry arm, however, they had to work with different ammunition. This is going to be much like we saw with the Austrian Verndel in a previous episode. These carbines had their own unique cartridge. And so that would mean that the would-be cavalry Comblain would need to chamber the carbine version of the Albini Braidlin round. And like last time, we'll see that once adopted, the Comblain cartridge takes on a life of its own. Lead bullet paper patch driven by black powder, this 11 by 42.5 millimeter rimmed cartridge would in just a few years evolve to sport a uniquely short shoulder as adapted for the Comblain. Like our rifle, this was also an unsupported chamber and would blow out when fired. As the Comblains came to various nations and the years went by, you see a fair few iterations of this general cartridge, but the chambers, again, like the rifles, seem to be the same across all Comblain carbines, unless very specifically noted for very specific models. The carbine itself began with the Belgian army's adoption of a cavalry Mousqueton Comblain in July of 1871. Unlike the Garde Civique's rifle, this carbine is made of steel, chambers the aforementioned shorter cartridge, and boasts a shrouded hammer. Being of earlier construction than last time's 1882 model, we'll also see a separate lower tang piece and two screw wrists set through that stock. Instead of being produced by the syndicate, licensing was issued to the state-run manufacturer de arms de la Tat. It's likely some 3,000 or so were ordered at first, and while more were produced over the years, we can't exactly name a total, and I'll show you why in a few moments. And for that same mysterious reason, service for the original cavalry comblains would be entirely during peacetime. But before I get there, we have to yet again visit Brazil, who, if you recall from last time, adopted their first comblain in 1873. At the same time, they would order between two and 3,000 Comblain carbines. Recall, their long rifle is the Carabina, and so this became the Muscatau. Other than the stocking and being fitted for a bayonet, the Brazilian Muscatau is near identical to the Belgian cavalry carbine. Same steel action, shrouded hammer, separate lower tang, and chambering. And for about the next decade, this was it for Comblain carbines, which is fair because a lot of nations actually stalled on cavalry and other specialty carbines 
during this unique period. That's partially because we're sitting in that sort of repeater lull, a time when magazine repeaters and early small bore, uh, but still black powder cartridges were being seriously considered by a lot of armies. Ultimately, the introduction of smokeless powder would finally make the decision to move to magazine rifles and small bore bullets an undebatable course of action. But before that, just before it as a matter of fact, a lot of carbine decisions lagged behind infantry concerns that were also sort of stalled out. However, Belgium was seeing a growing need for shortened rifles, ones that they could give to cavalry, artillery, and other specialty troops, because this was also an era of more and more specialized roles in which troops would need lighter personal arms for infrequent direct fighting. Since there was some doubt on the direction of arms technology, the simple solution was just to rework what they already had on hand. So the 1871 carbines were updated to one of two patterns. The General 7183 was another cavalry carbine still lacking a bayonet. This was intended for just about any sort of mounted troops and also found homes with guides and the artillery transport troops. The second was the 7183 Moldefi. This was for administrative services. In practice, it could be issued anywhere a full rifle was not needed, but you may want a bayonet, which was a version of the Albini socket bayonet. Both versions of the 83 changed their rear sight bases from a maximum 600 meters to 1,000. The shrouded hammers were dropped for a flat-backed but otherwise standard rear hammer, and a loop was added behind the under lever on the underside of the action right at the rear. Almost all of these original 1871 carbines were converted to one of the two patterns, making originals extremely rare. This conversion process has also clouded the numbers of original carbines because production of new guns in the 83 format did continue all the way through 1890, and it kept the same sequential serial numbers. It appears, however, roughly 8,000 carbines in total were produced, which means that even this gun is a rare sight, even at the time in the 1880s. So let's happily take a closer look. Ooh, versus last time, this is a much smaller and lighter gun, although still fairly big. I mean, a little bit bigger than some of the later bolt action carbines we see. But let's start with the usual tour. We're straight wristed metal butt plate. Now, interestingly specific to this gun, uh, let me get where you guys can see that. There's a wood plug where the rear sling swivel would have been when it was an 1871 model. Remember, this is an updated model. It's converted from something else. So uh, that wood plug fills the old sling swivel. The new one is here. It's not too bad, right? That guy uh, is actually where they sort of clipped the lower tang, fitted this piece. There's a screw to set her at the bottom. She's dovetailed in at the front. And then boom, we've got a position right behind the locking action. Now. If I bring her down, she looks fairly familiar here. We'll talk more about that in a second. But as we get forward, like a miniature version of long rifle, we got the reinforcement. We got a tiny uh, ladder rear sight with some tangent elements. We've got a mid position barrel band. And it's not until we get to the front that things look a little different. We have a carbine style front cap with front sight protectors, these little wings on either side. And there would have been a cleaning rod right here. Unfortunately, it's been lost on this model. I did Photoshop it back into existence for our original photo because I photographed one of these out of Springfield that had suffered fire damage. This one has not suffered fire damage, but is missing its rod. Between the two, I was able to stitch together a reasonable facsimile. So let me roll this back down. Now, the interesting thing to note is the sling position, uh, the end cap, uh, that, those little things are all updates. Uh, the fact that you can see the hammer is an update because originally the 71 would have had a shrouded hammer. This is a replacement hammer that allows you to actually manipulate the hammer so you can set her down to half cock. Same safety as the long rifle. And then the other advantage on this one is that if you were uh, to leave this all the way back, and this is not the straightest thing in the world, I understand that, but you get the idea. You can see right over it to the rear sight. If you have it all the way down, as if you fired the gun or the gun is otherwise empty or just or no longer um, cocked, well, it, you can't clear it for being able to see the sight. So if you're behind the gun and you can't see your rear sight, something's up and you might want to reload or at least check what's happening. So not a bad little feature and certainly much easier to manipulate with a sharp tip than it was on the long rifle with the big curvy large surfaced hammer. I can actually really get 
a hook on that. And you can hear it's real positive. So let me get that down to half cock a second. Let's talk about the differences in the receiver. So last time you saw the long rifle, as a matter of fact, I don't know why I'm holding out. It's right here. Now on the long rifle, it's not just that it chambers a larger cartridge that this receiver seems longer. They did extend it for strength and to also better fit up against the stock. But you may notice this one has an extra screw. That screw is because the lower tang, this component down here, as a matter of fact, now I gotta go back to making room. The lower tang is actually a separate piece. You may even be able to see the sort of seam here where this whole lower assembly is separate and therefore probably vulnerable to the screw coming loose or to some other weakness down in here. Uh, that was done away with, and of course, the 1881-82 models. So uh, this is from a holdover from the 71. A lot of South American guns are like this, and you'll see that third screw. The other two are doing the same thing they're doing on the rifle. One's working the hinge of this guy, and the other's holding that ejector and allowing it to clear, uh, rotate. Uh, overall, the internal action is basically the same. Very minor changes in here. Nothing worth really exploring because it's the same single V-spring. Uh, and really the heart of this gun does not change for its entire service life. It's sort of the dressings and features and reinforcements that change. But certainly cool to see a much earlier version of this gun. Now, if we're talking about uh, early features, I do want to clear one more, which is, because I almost forgot, right there at the top, two tang screws. Because again, the stock is not nested, the receiver is not further back. So we're holding in place by two tang screws. From what little or what few I've encountered, uh, I'm going to say this fitment right here tends to look a little more frazzled on these earlier style guns than it does on the later 82. I think it was probably a pretty solid improvement. So again, that's sort of reinforcing the idea that the Comblain uh, had a very strong heart of its action. And then the dressings had to adapt around that. For a single shot rifle, it's kind of hard to beat. All right, gang, we all know what you really came here for, and that's to see May pull the trigger on this thing. Now, <laughs> that's cool. Before we talk about the war, I have just a couple extra models to briefly run down. Belgium would adopt one more Comblain in 1888, likely after the expiration of the patent. These were produced for the rural guards, a sort of ranger and game warden combined. Curiously, they chamber the full-size rifle cartridge and use a special dedicated bayonet. Back in Brazil, there would be another carbine offered up in 1892, specifically for the artillery and engineers. This was largely a duplicate of the old 1873, though now they have an integral lower tang and a single tang screw like the 1882 receivers. These were ordered after both the syndicate had broken up and the patent had expired, so the brothers Nagant 
took over the job, producing at least 2,000 and perhaps as many as 5,000. I should also point out that in 1894, Brazil would switch to the smokeless 7x57mm Mauser cartridge, and by 1898 had decided to begin converting some of their comblains, both rifle and carbine, to the new cartridge for use by military police and possibly the National Guard. These were done by, well, boring out and relining the barrel, the old Salerno method, and then cutting a new chamber. Overall, it seems the Comblain's locking strength was more than enough for the new cartridge, though. Okay, so that covers the walk-up on the carbines. There really isn't that much history there. And since we made it through the carbines, and while I did go a little bit over this, we really do only care about this guy, and maybe a little bit the modified version, but even that is sketchy. Recall from our Belgian Mauser episodes that a whole series of carbines would emerge after the adoption of the 1889, and even one based on the 1893 Mauser. But through all that, the little Comblain carbine actually stayed in limited service, mostly in transportation, and in particular, the troops of the artillery train, the guys hauling equipment and ammunition for the artillery. Now, proving any of this out in detail has been nearly impossible for me, and that's probably because the Comblain would prove to be both materially useful and politically volatile when war were declared. Alright, this is where our two episodes finally meet. Mm, sort of. I have a long rifle comblane with the guard Civique and a carbine hanging out with the supply guys. Uh, let's clear the little guy first, okay? This photo is actually what got me tracking down the carbine information. Because you can see this injured man is clearly carrying a 7183 carbine as he rides along with the artillery train. In this regard, the Comblain is being used a lot like an M1 carbine would in World War II when handed to transportation troops. It's a defensive-only weapon, and yet it and its bigger brother would prove to be something of a problem even in their limited roles. On the very face of it, both rifles never saw an updated jacketed bullet. They're both still shooting lead, which was a problem because Belgium was a signer of the Hague Convention of 1899. That unjacketed round was now prohibited. We had a whole thing about Britain and Germany with dum-dums on that. On that fact alone, officially the Comblains never served in the war. In practice, however, well, I have this photo. So we're going to say a very, very limited, likely almost entirely overlooked carbine service in the war. With so few ever made, it's hardly a big impact regardless if all of them served. So put that guy down for a minute. This long rifle, however, it's a much bigger story. So let's talk about the Guard Civique and the rape of Belgium. First, the Guard was actually already being deprioritized before the war. Belgian martial reforms in 1909 with a lot system uh, and in 1913 with universal compulsory service uh, well, this not only made the guards somewhat redundant, but also cut off their supply of able-bodied men who were supposed to not have military attachments. Even so, by the start of World War I, they still had roughly 46,000 active guardsmen, 33 companies of light infantry, 17 batteries of artillery, 4 squads of light horse, and 3 companies of armed firemen. Firemen with comblains. And while all those sound useful in an all-out war, I guess even the firemen, they will create a lot of controversy. On the same day as the German invasion, August 4th of 1914, the Belgian parliament met to vote through a series of emergency laws. What they did not cover, however, was the role of the Garde Civique. They were not expected to take part in the actual defense, the, the combat part anyway. The Guard remained under the Ministry of the Interior. On August 5th, all non-active Guard were reactivated, resulting in some 100,000 extra men, who began a somewhat haphazard and largely autonomous course of actions. 
A fair number of the guards were put to work on securing lines of communication, guarding key infrastructure, escorting prisoners, and maintaining social order outside of combat areas. With members of the police and gendarmerie joining the army proper, the guard often became the only armed branch of the government in many cities and towns. They guarded food, uh, they guarded banks, and generally they prevented looting. At the borders of the country, armed conflict involving the guard soon became inevitable, though. Incidents of guard firing on German scouts, vehicles, and troops soon had the Germans paying attention. They were having flashbacks to the Franco-Prussian War, in which the overwhelmed French had fielded the dreaded franc tireur an offshoot of the rifle clubs and paramilitary groups formed during the Luxembourg Crisis, these fighters didn't have what you would consider to be an official martial uniform, but they did have excellent rifles and marksmanry skills, making them a sort of French partisan, often fighting in guerrilla fashion in their own territory now occupied by Germany. The Franc Terreur would harass the German army with effectively insurgent sniper fire. Now, in World War I, the German command officers? <laughs> well, those that remembered these civilian fighters didn't do so much with a whole lot of warmth. And so when occupying territory, the German officers would react vengefully at the slightest hint of such activity, often to the point of executions and reprisals. In theory, this should not be much of a problem since Belgium did not have Frank Terreur in this war and never issued an order for anything like them. But what they did have was another quasi-military armed force of largely civilian marksmen. As German forces began to occupy Belgium, three issues really came to a head. One, many of the guards saw themselves as servants of their city and would try to remain in occupied territory in an attempt to help keep order, regardless of whether the leadership was Belgian or German. Uh, you're going to see a mix, because some German commanders didn't think this was weird, and some thought it was horrifying, and that they were sitting there plotting and, and, and raising an insurrection behind their lines. Uh, this issue would ultimately remain a little bit more rare, as the Germans could really just disarm and disband those local guards as they encountered them. Be like, no nah, man, you're, you're not in charge, we are, get out of here. Uh, two, the guard was short on equipment. Theoretically, uh, a guard is recognizable by his bowler-like hat, old-style coat, and would be carrying a modern Mauser 1889 rifle. In reality, that gun never fully replaced our Comblain here. Plus, the army needed every rifle they could get, so it was better for the guard to use up all their 1882s, the sort we saw in our last episode. So it's plenty common to see black powder single shots in guard hands in 1914. While the bullet is a problem, we do at least now have an armed and uniformed combatant, which should satisfy the 1907 Hague Convention. I guess don't get caught actually shooting anyone though. But recall, I said some 100,000 inactive guards were called to serve, and they were definitely well short of firearms and uniforms in many cases. And so we get images like this, men with scant armbands, armed with a double-barrel shotgun or whatever they can find, setting up defensive barricades, inspecting vehicles, and likely even getting into shootouts with the German army. These guys, there is no way you can tell the Germans that they are not Franck Terreur. You also couldn't tell the Germans that they didn't exist because the Belgian media at the time had a habit of heralding them as defenders of the realm, the, the sort of grassroots activity of a country suddenly at war against its will. Germans reading the same newspapers as they found them were less pleased. The looming tragedy in making was actually noticed by the Belgian government, likely because of rapid German protests. So on August 8th, just four days into the war, they ordered all guard had to be fully uniformed and overtly carrying a firearm or they had to get out of any sort of conflict role in the war. This should have eased the situation, but unfortunately we have issue three and the biggest issue out of all of them. The Germans were freaked the f out. We saw something like this in our Gewehr 98 episode where rumors swirled that having a sawback bayonet would get you executed by the Entente, and so German leadership had to pull their use because troops were rejecting them out of fear. Well, in Belgium, and long before that particular scare, the German officers were keenly afraid and would definitely and repeatedly overreact to any civilian resistance or just discovering civilians in possession of hunting rifles, shotguns, or 
deploy a bunch of these guys laying around, right? In the best cases, these situations went to court and hopefully saw the accused sent to Germany as a prisoner of war, paraded around as a franc terreur for propaganda reasons, which also further fueled the fears. Many properly uniformed guard were caught up in these shows and would largely be released in 1915, thankfully. Those that were not so lucky? Well, there is a lot of political pushing back and forth on the topic post-war. Who did exactly what and how often who did it first? But the short answer is yes. Non-uniformed men uh, with weird guns probably fired on some Germans. And yes, Germans probably hung a few of them and some extra people to make a message. Uh, this was obviously them thinking that they were punishing insurgent behavior inside the realm of The Hague. This in turn now fuels fears in the Guard Civique about being executed no matter what they do, and while some desert, others become even more determined to stop the evil Germans. As the Belgian army is pushed back, the Guard begins to both scatter at the edges and contract at its center. Many guard units burnt their records and their uniforms and disposed of their weapons, allowing them to blend back into the civilian backdrop as the Germans advanced. The more resolved and better organized began to support army defenses of major cities, building and manning fortifications. Now the confusion on how the Germans were actually treating the guard results in some being told to stand down, like what happened in Brussels, in which largely the guard force was willing to fight it out to the end until diplomatic channels intervened. With the Belgian government finally realizing the Germans were actually taking the uniformed guard civique as prisoners alive, uh, well, they would feel better about fielding them as reserves, combining the Brussels Guard with the remnants of the Liège and the uh, four East Flanders Corps that they had available. They formed an army group of about 18,000 guards, along with various volunteers and scattered gendarmerie. This ad hoc group was fielded south of Antwerp, hunting German scouts and giving the impression of a larger army presence. These guard forces would finally help cover the retreat of the army from Antwerp, which would be essentially the final act of the Guard Civique. On October 13th, King Albert I decreed the dissolution of the Guard, with any remaining younger members transferred to the army directly. So yeah, the Guard was a weird case magnified by existing German fears. They were constantly accused of organizing insurgency and added greatly to the German army's brutal treatment of Belgian civilians. In many ways, this is another one of those big firestorms in histories brought about by an abundance of kindling lying around, here in the form of Germans' previous experience and Belgium's odd guard civique. And the spark? Well, if I were a betting man, I'd put it on this gun here, a simple single-shot black powder rifle, one that faded in the background of Belgium's everyday life, almost unnoticed by anyone in 1914. And yet, once the Germans march across the border, their officers, they see this thing and see a potential death sentence for uh, themselves or their men, a sign of civilian uprising, and at the very least, a war crime for the bullet alone. That last bit, though, I don't know if they can stand too high on that horse because some 1882s have turned up with Reichsadler marks on their stocks, meaning they were taken into German reserve use, likely for guards and for training, meaning the 1882 also freed up some Mausers for the German front lines, and that they also wandered around with those lead bullets. Now, whether they fought with them or not, that's another matter. Otherwise, the 1882s were largely scrapped, destroyed for security, or maybe melted to recover steel, and many that did survive the German handling would then be destroyed post-war as part of destroying German inventory, which kind of fits with what we see in the current market. It's almost more common to find the earlier and more lightly produced phosphor bronze actions than it is to find the later 1882 steel guns. The ones the Germans didn't bother seizing or doing much about, the bronze, well, they survived. So we're lucky to be able to see this one, I suppose. Now, post-war, the guard was not reformed. I've read it was disbanded properly in 1920, but I can't find by what means. I know it wasn't until 1984 that it was struck from the Belgian constitution. Returning to our inventor, he never did give up his work with patents until at least 1891. 
Most notably, he did try to compete in the repeater rifle market, although it appears his designs did not make the cut. Instead, he'd pass away in December of 1893 at the age of 80 years. Now, even having covered the long and short Belgian rifles in much of the South American guns, there are still lots of deviations and mysteries around this particular pattern of arm. I again urge you to read a recommended book by Curtin in order to see all the miniaturized commercial guns, engraved prize rifles, and more. All right, let's get over to May for her opinion on both this rifle and the carbine. All right, once more, we made room for May. We also barely have room for this long rifle, and we have plenty of room for this little carbine. Now, the interesting thing is we're kind of out of chronological order, sort of. Yeah, it's interesting that the carbine came before the rifle. Not this one, though. Not so, this one? Okay. Yeah. Welcome to the weird way of how we had to stack this episode. This is the 1871 carbine, then updated in 1883. That is an 1882 rifle. That means that while this was updated later, the mechanism itself, like the way it has a two-piece tang and just some basic fittings and stuff, this gun is an older design than that gun. It's just that it got updated after, after that it. gun was invented. Okay, sure, makes sense. And realistically, I'm not sure the date that one was manufactured, so I don't know which one's technically older of the two of them anyway, because they saw concurrent production. Hmm. So it's pretty wild. Uh, yeah. This one's 1884, though. I do know that one's written right on there. Cool. So uh, let's talk about the long rifle first, though, because that's definitely the more critical arm to the series, and it's going to be the one that's far more common, like 8,000 max of these things were ever made. So ergonomically, what's it like working with that Belgian Comblain 1882 Guard Civique rifle? Those are a lot of words to say really, really fast. I'm not going to even attempt that. So we're going to call this long boy, short boy. Let's stick with that. <laughs> Just to make it a little bit easier on me. Mm -hmm. All right, so we got the long boy here. Obviously, a lot of length, a lot of weight to it. I'm surprised up there at nine pounds, and you definitely feel all nine pounds. I'm kind of grateful. I wish, don't get me wrong, two fed mag, there would have been extra rounds in there. Oh, would have yeah. been way all better. The way the front. But the problem then comes is like, how many more pounds would that have been added onto it? Yeah, that's a beefy boy. So where's that balanced at? So realistically, it's actually kind of not bad. It's balanced right behind the rear sight, which is actually where I would grip with my left hand anyway. Which tells you how much mass is in that lock and how much is at the rear of the gun. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because that's a long, heavy barrel to have hanging out there and still have the balance point that far back. I weirdly thought before I even picked it up that the balance was gonna be an issue, but instantly feeling this, I went, oh wow, that's, that's not gonna be as bad as I thought. So if you push up to that rear barrel band, you're pretty good. Oh yeah, you can go all the way up and that's perfectly reasonable. I just find this is as far back as you're gonna get and then up to the rear band, that's probably going to be the extent of your grip. You're not okay. really going to grip past that. I can't see that. So what else is going on ergonomically? Like, how's this feeling? So I do wish they'd added a semi-pistol grip because when working the action... Okay, so I know, I know, I know, I know. I've always been pro semi-pistol grip. But in this action in particular, I do think it really would have been helpful because you go to work the action and... I do want to talk about working the action, but right. I want to I want to get right, into the semi pistol grip. We lower the here. gun to load it because it's a single shot breech loader. Right, and then when you bring it up, granted, it is kind of nice. There's this little dip right here, and if you notice in the videos, I do grip it with my middle finger, and that feels pretty good. But I've lost any kind of purchase or extra grip back here at the bottom, and I just I feel like especially on this rifle, it would have been beneficial for just making this whole process so much faster. See, I'm going to argue with her now. Oh. Because you see a lot of like trap guns and stuff that have straight wrist. And we talked about this at one point, but a lot of the guns that were specifically designed to come down and load and bring back up, they left them straight wrist because you can then manipulate the wrist area and slide your hand up and down. So I'm trying to think, was it like the Verndal I think we had this argument on, I want to say, or was it the 1871? There's, there's been a few episodes where we've talked about single shots and how when we were dealing with single shots that you had to lower down, you definitely didn't mind having a straight wrist because it was an easier move to slide your hand up and down the wrist instead of letting go of everything necessarily. So I kind of like, weirdly, I really like this system, what you said about being able to hang your middle finger. I actually like it a lot because it kind of cuts the difference because you can slide your hand, pop open, mm -hmm. and then when you bring your hand back up, that middle finger, you get you it guide around the outside. It kind of swoops around it. Yeah, yeah, I did feel that. And then you pull that up in, and you can actually get 
some tug there. Like I found as this, opposed to none. Out of all the single shot rifles we've done, I found this system to be the most comfortable in terms of being able to get it back into your shoulder, short of having an actual semi pistol grip. Style. You know, I suppose I could see your argument on that one because whereas with all the others. There's usually nothing down there, except no. for maybe something like the lever actions, but that's different. That's a yeah, your different hand, system. Your hand would be in it, but that's a, that's a magazine repeater at that point, mm -hmm. the way we've shot them. So, uh, not that there's not exceptions to that, but it is. this has been probably the most unique in terms of how you actually end up gripping it and having that, thing, that middle finger rest. Yeah, that's a fair point. I think I'll concede my argument on that one, and, are, and I understand your point better than mine now. Now, we're out of order, though, because we've closed the action... But we haven't opened it. What's it like actually working this gun? So actually working the gun, it's it's interesting. So you could choose to try to just force it open because you could just choose to push it down, try to pull it up, and it's going to be stiff if you try it that way. The best way if you're just going to go at it straight would probably be a little bit diagonally, but that's not even the best way to do it. We found after just kind of playing with it a little bit, if you kind of turn if you kind of go with it and rotate your hand rotate your thumb on the inside and pop it that motion all together it kind of gives you a little bit of extra momentum i feel which gives you a little extra force with it it's kind of like spreading butter like Kinda, you yeah, just put your thumb actually... down and then work up or a whittling motion but you just get your thumb in there start with it down roll it forward and she pops and she'll always pop it's this jerking motion mm -hmm. which i suspect was absolutely intentional to help with ejection yeah you really don't feel like it's it's mushy or that it wants to like just sag really? into place out, not... out of place i mean but it really definitely just clicks out no there's not a uh, slow way to open up this action it is it is pop or not mm -hmm. and that's all because of that spring retention back at the rear what you're really overcoming is this rear spring and so once you go over center of that, boom, you're on your way. Gotcha. That does make sense then why it feels that way. But yes, definitely I, after a few tries between you and I, we definitely came to that conclusion that, that that rotating motion, it really feels much more natural. The gun likes it and it pops with it very well. Okay. So, so this gun has a safety mechanism. We yes. opted not to film it. We did. So there is a reason for that. And that's because... I just, this hammer is just so stiff as it is, and I just, I didn't necessarily feel completely comfortable using the safety with it. I just, I didn't, I didn't want to trust it 100%. I, I guess nothing of the gun, you know, that it did or performance-wise on range did it make it seem unsafe. It's just, that was... I guess the way to use this safety in any in a way that makes sense, the chamber around and have it not fire. Right. You would have to go to a chamber with the hammer cocked all the way back. Mm -hmm. And then you would have to hold the hammer back, pull the trigger and release it far enough forward that you 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 know it's halfway. And then you let go of the trigger and then you kind of just ride it down. It's like, oh okay good, that's the half yep. cock. So yeah, basically you have to ride it to the half cock. And that's my problem is that I think I could have done it, and it could have been okay, but I just didn't want that extra little bit of concern of well, that potential go off. We've seen it on other actions, like the lever actions, and we've tested, we've shown it, right? Spring tension on those hammers was nowhere near as heavy. Mm -mm. This thing swings a hammer, let me tell you. And the other thing is, there's a big difference, we'll talk more about the carbine in a second, but on that one, you know, it's got a textured hammer, but really how much control do you feel like you have over that hammer holding it while we're pulling the trigger? I mean, it is an incredibly stiff hammer. And unfortunately, unlike the carbine, and we'll get in the comparison in a minute, this one's kind of a curved hammer. And granted, it does have some striations on the top, but that's still, that's that's barely anything. There's barely any extra, I guess, surface tension right there that I feel like that gives me. Right. So we opted not to do it. We didn't want to have an ND on range, but it does right. have a half cock safety. Not the most advisable safety, but it has a half cock safety. Yeah, it, it, and it does work. It's just we just opted not to do it. Right. Now, I think the last thing that people are going to be curious about, and it's the first thing I noticed when I got a hold of a comm blame, hmm. that trigger position. It is extremely low. It is it, yeah. the, the part where your finger actually rests is way down below the frame. I what? mean, I think I ended up gripping, yeah, I was actually closer to the middle up at the top, which kind of made it feel a bit awkward for placement. Right. Now, a function of that is, if you saw the animation, it's because it uses that one spring to do everything, which, which is mechanically is insane. impressive. Yeah. But again, that super stiff hammer spring is also your super stiff trigger spring. So you end up with this really long trigger so you can get a lot of mechanical advantage there. You can get down at the bottom of it, and you, the further lower you go, the smoother a pull you get. 
But at the same time, you're also now further and further from the action of the gun. Right. How is the trigger on this, really? So, it is an interesting system, because on this one, there is just no take-up. It is basically, you pull the trigger, you add a little extra force, add a little extra force, you expect it to move at all, shift any. Nope. When it finally you just hit the right amount of, like, a force that you're pulling through, boom, she drops. Yeah, just a single stage. It is amazing. Now, how hard is that trigger pull to you? Um, I would say it's probably around... Maybe four pounds, five pounds. Okay, so not awful, but did, how did it feel though? Like uh, subjectively. I mean, subjectively, it was it was a very smooth, crisp pull. There wasn't anything to really feel like. The problem was is that there was just there's no take up. So I really, it's kind of hard to compare. The only thing I can say is that it's kind of weird just feeling the trigger because normally I'm used to something, tr- some yeah, waggle, some something. And then on top of that, in general, just the shape of it, it's, it's an unusual shape trigger. Like that's about it. Those two things. Yeah. I definitely feel like for me, my hand is canted much lower than anything ever. You if know? anything, you're kind of pulling up like more diagonally with yeah, it. Yeah. I'm trying kind of to strange. drop my hand down and get a hold of it. So I'm twisting my wrist. If I'm up higher, it feels more natural, but there's no, there's no torque there. Mm-hmm. And you need that extra pull because especially this one, the carbine, it's even heavier than the rifle for whatever oh, reason. you're getting too far ahead of this, sir. That's supposed to be my job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's not... I don't think that's particular to the carbine. No. I think ultimately it's just sort of the difference between these two springs and how much use they may have had. That's also um, probably a factor. Yeah, so I can't say that the carbines are heavier. I just say that we have a heavier and a lighter one, although... We're talking about the difference between four and six pounds or so, I'd say. Yeah, it's not that drastic of a difference. No, but it is, I agree, super weird. And then on top of all that, argue with me if you will. Oh, uh, I will. By the time I started shooting them, because I got a couple rounds out. Yeah. I forgot all about how weird the trigger was. No, you absolutely do, because I think that it just it just becomes such a natural motion. You, I, I don't know, you don't, there's nothing to really snag you with it. That's just it. Like with other triggers where you have to deal with the grittiness or you have to deal with any any lumpiness or, or mushiness to it. This one, there's just nothing to it. So uh, essentially, I don't know about you, but I just kind of got into the motion of shooting the gun. And by like the fifth round, I was surprised that it was already over. As long as it's not too, too heavy, single stages to me tend to be pretty easy to shoot. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem is there's some safety issues there. Yeah. But uh, don't worry, you got your half cock position. Yeah. Uh, in terms of military safeties, you know, a lot of people prefer a single stage trigger on a sporting rifle or something like that. Yeah. So, no, it's weird. I, I really, even dry handling now, when I'm thinking about that trigger position, it feels awful. And mm-hmm. then I go out and shoot the gun and I don't notice it at all. Yeah. Okay. It's bizarre. So we did the trigger. We did the action. Yeah, we talked about, talked about pretty much all the ergonomics. Legs that... and balance. Okay. So where are we at for actually shooting the thing? What's that like? So first up, sights. Yeah, I mean, they're, there's nothing really super unusual about them. I mean, they're kind of like rounded V-notch sights. They're not quite as tight as I wish they would be, and they're not quite as deep set as I wish they would be, but they're not they're not unreadable. They're it's not like terrible. 1880s ladder where they're just not quite as sharp because they rounded off the edges more back then, but that's they read to me. I don't know about you. Yeah, no, they read to me just fine. I didn't have an issue with that. You can't complain about your sight radius on that thing. No, I definitely have a good extension. I mean, granted, they could have brought it back a little bit, so I guess give me a little more, but that's about it. Yeah. Um. And then we already talked about trigger and everything else ahead of time. The only thing we else really talk about is the recoil on this. And You're skipping a step. We've talked about opening and closing the action, but what's it like actually throwing a cartridge in there? Did you find it uh, awkward? Well, to be honest, I... I I didn't find it awkward after after just looking at it. It's kind of obvious. Like it didn't feel that any different from any other single loading action that we've done before. Okay, so, so it, granted, now I have to make sure I don't obviously. Yeah, I'm interrupting you. I know. Okay. I know. I did that. Uh-huh. Um, essentially, you just want to make sure, of course, you don't do anything weird, like set it in front of the extractor or anything like that. But that's about it. I can, mean, that'd be kind of hard to do. You got me wondering. Can you I know. Even... Can you do that? Well, to be honest, it makes me I think. Of, I've seen re- people do it with little twenty twos. Like that's true. Bruno's got a little one shot twenty too that you can lift the round past the extractor i've seen people do it so it's like maybe somebody could try it. no there's like a safety you think bevel. there's just too much oh okay there's, there's like a, a bevel, bevel. That okay that. you just finally made me think about could i even do that but yeah. I, don't, I don't think you can but that was the only thing i was like well, could i lift it past it and i was like well, i'm not obviously gonna try but like aside from that that was my one concern i had otherwise okay. it's not real different from any other single loader 
See, I felt it was just the same as loading like a rolling block. I felt yeah, no that's difference fair. there. However, there are single shot guns that I prefer, like the Mauser 71. Mauser 71's really straightforward. What I like about that one is you open up and you just slap it in the tray. And you and can you just, just rock it. Forward. Yeah, that one's I get that. That's Whereas true. Whereas this you have to like so you could you you pop open and throw it over your shoulder for the ejection. So it's kinda like the Verndal where you've got to yeah. put it directly into place. And you throw it I guess the idea is that you could do it a little higher though, like you could hold it up here. Mm-hmm. and keep it high on you if you needed to, whereas the Mauser, it's going to be the habit is to get it low and slap it in. But I tend to be more of a fan of the bolt-action single shot because you can slap it in the tray. But did you notice any difference, really? Not especially. Like I said, it, it, I'm used to... like I, I, That's why I think I brought up the Verndal earlier, just because that one is just a single one that you have to shove in and then close up the action. True. So there, there's nothing... About that, that seems unusual. Yes, the seventy one was more convenient. The Mauser seventy one was more convenient, but it, this wasn't anything I wasn't that was unexpected for me. Okay, um, so you get it locked in. Yep, uh, and definitely making sure I snap this into place. Like I think you can see on the video at one point, I really made sure I gripped it tight to make that snap a positive feeling. Yeah, but you feel that. Oh, you do. That's just it. You cannot accidentally. Not close this all the way. Well, I mean, you could try, but like you, you're gonna know when it's not seated because you're not gonna feel that click when it snaps back in. Yeah, and I believe it does have some out of battery safeties and things like that. Like, no, I lied. It doesn't have any out of battery safety. <laughs> we just so, saw that out. Oh, uh, yeah. Be careful. Although I, I say there's none, but actually, what's really happening is the shape of the hammer since it's tapered. When you drop the hammer with it slightly out of battery, it pulls it into battery. So, again, all that recoil force is going to be into the locking block. So it is actually safe, even if... I would assume that if you fire it without it completely locked, you're still fine. Although you may start to see some gas or other deterioration. I'm not going to test that, though. No. Just, to, just to be on the safe side. Okay, so it's very clearly closed. We heard from our snap. Yep, you hear it and you feel it from the snap. And then from there, you go to fire. We already talked about the trigger, trigger. and the sights. Um, recoil at that point. So nice big black powder plume comes out and then the recoil hits you and it, there was actually a substantial amount of recoil. Well, the carp but not for the not for the long boy. This one actually surprisingly had less recoil than what I was expecting. Really? Well, and don't get me wrong, there was some good climbing on it, but I don't know why. Black powder. Yeah, maybe that was it. Black powder always feels softer. It does. And then it makes the best. As someone who is filming you, the best sound. Like, oh my god, makes the best the smells. Best sound. Now, don't get me wrong, <laughs> this one's loud, that one sounds beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like, there's just this throaty rumble, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, I but guess. That's probably what I was expecting more. There still was a good amount of recoil, don't get me wrong. It's so like just, a I seven? expected. Mm, yeah, okay, sure, a seven. I was expecting probably to be like an eight, and then it came out a seven, and I was like, oh. Okay, no, that's not as bad as I thought. No, that mask can't hurt either. Mm -mm. No. So, uh, okay, cool. Good recoil. Mm, triggers a single stage, but kind of heavy. Mm -hmm. Sights are clear. Yep. Uh, loads pretty fast. And a good positioning for your middle finger down here for grip. Yeah, and I think that's where we need to have a conversation because I need to swap guns with you. <laughs> because at some point... I think you noticed it too. Yeah, huh? there's, there's something that we need to talk about, which is there are minor differences between these two. Most notably... About four pounds. Oh, really? I was going to go for the length as the most notable. <laughs> yeah, well, there is that. So uh, ergonomically, walk me through how the carbine feels in comparison to the long rifle. So for the carbine, obviously shorter, not as much weight to it. You know, we're looking at just over, you know, six, just under six and a half pounds. What? So like we've we've lost three pounds here ish yeah. between these two rifles. So it's, feels like it's more, definitely though. noticeable. You think so? That thing feels so much lighter than this one. And oh I, no no, I no yeah, it feels more of a difference. Sorry, I thought you meant it felt heavier. I was about to say no, it feels lighter than what. No, what we when I heard it was out. only a three pound difference, I was like, are you sure? Because this feels like such I think a it's tank. because you go from holding that to immediately grab this, and I even just now I I'm still saying that and it feels like this should be lighter, but I think it's because I was just holding that one. Okay. Well, um, action's the same, roughly. Yeah, pretty much no difference there. Um, I do want to say, down here, so this is where we were talking about earlier. Yeah, this little guy right here. Yep, so on the rifle, it's really, it's a decent big swoop in here that really, it, it cuts in so deep and so nice that even your big fingers, they look like yeah, they the fit comfortably. The contour of this is that my thumb fits in there with no pinching. Right. And then there's the spur here that really seats you so that you don't slide forward. Yep. You are hugged in there. 
There is definitely, there's no real worry about slipping your grip on this guy. What's going on there? Whereas with the carbine. So the carbine, unfortunately, it looks like... They did undercut it. Yeah, yeah, they did. So there is there is some extra, like, back into it. But the problem is, is that there's no extra curve up at the top to ensure that you don't accidentally slip forward any. The, the bevel, I guess I want to call it, like this little... Yeah, the belly of it. Yeah, the belly. It's just not quite as deep set. And on top of that... It's not as wide. It's a little so, narrower at yeah. the bottom. Like a V-shape versus a U-shape. So I barely just fit with that. I, I honestly, it, it just barely works for me. So I can only imagine how it would do for you. So you can hang on to that and tension it like we said. This one, however, just feels perfect. Oh, yeah. That one feels fantastic ergonomically. It okay. fits your fingers. This one, on the other hand, it does give some concern. Don't get me wrong. I weirdly actually use this second little notch right here. If you watch the videos, like I weirdly use that for my middle finger. So I, I feel like in that respect, I, I did actually that, gain a little extra right there. I don't know that I ever thought about the spread between the middle and ring finger. Yeah, I, I, th they did make me think about it. This was the only rifle Stop I've ever thought about. making me think about, about stuff. <laughs> so, Doing it on live, too. Um, okay, so grip's a little worse, but it's the earlier grip. Yep. The gun's much lighter, much mm -hmm. handier. Uh, do you think you saw, to me, the sights look about the same. Yeah, there's not really much of a difference. Well, sights, yeah, no, I'm, I'm trying to do that while the hammer's not there's even There's a caught. difference. Uh, you can read the sights from the rifle, whether the hammer's forward or not. Yes, If, if the hammer's true. down on the carbine, it blocks the sights. Right, but yeah, you, that is kind of cool to know. So you'll you'll know when you lift it up if you're ready or not, if you can see. Right. But yeah, there's not really, no, they're both kind of rounded V-notches. There's really not that much of a difference. Right. Shorter ladder, but not a big deal. No. So, uh, recoil. That's pretty yeah, much that's it. Yeah, that's gonna be it, right? Well, we, we already mentioned the trigger differences too. Yeah, so recoil. That well, essentially is what it's it comes just, to. It's the little cartridge. Yeah. Is the little cartridge easier to load? It is easier to load. There, there's. I didn't really have any issues with it. I okay. mean, you tried it too. I didn't find it all that different from the large one to load. Realistically, um, the recoil on that was interesting, though. I still felt I felt that was a substantial amount of recoil with the with, uh, with the carbine. Would you say that the if this was at a seven, was the recoil at a different number, or do you think that the smaller cartridge and the smaller gun balanced out? I think it did balance better. I think okay. I'm going to go with that. It did so balance 6. a little 5? bit better. Six, yeah, I'll go with a six or a six point five. You sure. said you felt more recoil. But that's just it. It just felt like it was disproportionate, I suppose. Okay, so there's recoil linear, and then there's what you call muzzle flip. Is there a difference there? Is that what you're feeling? Probably. Because you're not having as much weight at the front end of that gun. So without that weight hanging out there, you could have less overall recoil and still have more muzzle flip. I think that's what I was feeling, was that I felt like there was more muzzle flip than we what I was no expecting. We have no ability to review the footage right now because we're not going <laughs> to. So we'll see if she was right or wrong. Call You'll me see out. if she's right or wrong. They're totally going to She will know until comment. she's editing this like two days from now. Oh, God. I'm going to see it. I'm going to be like, oh, I hate you, May. I hate you so much. Hey, your subjective experience counts. I'm even just if remembering it. I'm going off of memory, and I just distinctively remember thinking, ah, oh, that feels like there was more There was more pop to it than what I was originally expecting, I That's guess. Fair. But it didn't feel like there was as much coming back into my shoulder. I'll say that. Like, I just didn't feel like there was much as much pushback. I'm sure it looked like there was. Yeah. God only knows. I know a secret. One of these guns, if not both of them, gave you a much bigger bruise than any bruise you have ever received in the show. Because the only bruise I know of that you've received in this show, you've received two. One well, was, what was the third? Well, this one. Tiga Bear and then the wall gun. And then wait, uh, the was wall gun wasn't for the show. Okay, stop. Wall gun wasn't for the show. That was a promo. Okay. Uh, the 1903 Air Service. Because it was... All those rounds of 30 out six, and you were getting oh, up and down, yeah. up and down. I guess that technically so did. So you ended up with like a quarter size bruise. It wasn't that bad, but you ended up with like an oblong quarter size bruise. The Tiga Bear gave you like a nickel size bruise, and that's it. That Everybody one, thought, by the way, that was seated in sandbags, so right. that would have been worse. Right. And then uh, these guns gave you a bruise, but not on your shoulder. Did you want to talk about that? Yeah, I, I, I guess I did forget about that because uh, it's not something you really think about, but. For these, for extraction especially was, it. I want to say on the carbine, if I remember correctly, it I took me a minute now. to remember which one of the two was popping more difficult. But I do remember one of the two, I just could not get the round to pop the first two times. And you can see it the first time, it barely comes out like a quarter of an inch in his little poop. And I was like, okay, fine. Second time, I pop it harder and it comes out like three-fourths of the way. And I went... 
well, how freaking hard do I got to do this? So then I just went, screw it. And so I popped it as hard as I could, opened the action, and, and I ended up slamming the toe of the butt into my stomach, into several my side several times. To get all the shots. So that's pretty much what I did all day was I hit myself in the side. So when we got home, I had just this massive, like, oblong bruise along the side of my stomach just because I couldn't get it to open and and pop the cartridge easily. Now, the reason for that is probably because of the hand-loaded ammo having a slightly narrow, narrower rim than what would have been in the original ammo. And also, it probably wasn't quite as wide. Like, the differences in the rim, because we're just working hand loads, thank you, David, and, and Kristen, Kristen, yeah, thank you guys. Um, the, the way we had to work up on the hand loads, they're not perfect. They, they work for the chamber, they work for the rifling, they shoot the bullet. But extraction, we couldn't get to be perfect, and that's because we'd have had to have been, like, turning brass, and that's a lot of time to go through when you're trying to make a show every other week. Mm-hmm. So uh, we got as close as we could, and it suffered some ejection problems. I highly doubt we would have had those problems with the original ammo. This thing seems like a very strong ejector. Oh, yeah. Like, with the, especially with the rifle they ammo. They both do, yeah. yeah. So I, I honestly just think it came down to that, but dang, if I didn't get the rest of them to extract after the second one. All right, so I guess we're down to the final question. Would you be comfortable with either of these two guns in World War One? So am I going to take either single shot black powder rifle or carbine into the war <laughs> oh boy oh boy these questions you give me okay so no it's a hard no it's a single shot black powder with a weird cartridge like. unfortunately even no, no matter how much fun i had with them and I, I did have a great deal of fun with the carbine because that was my jam right unfortunately it's it's got to be a no because yeah if you had to fight with work. one or the other if I had to fight? Like, if you're like, hey, uh, we're out of guns, and we're going to send you into the woods or trench or whatever it may be, and we're going to give you one of these, do you go for the full-powered cartridge, or do you go for the lighter cartridge and handier maneuverability? I, you know, it sucks. It depends on the situation, probably, because it just depends on if Am I going to have time to lay down with that one? I'd or not lay down boy. with this the This is one of those occasions I'd choose the big boy. You would choose the big boy? I'm just going to go with as much power and as much sight radius and as much barrel as I can get. Like, I just I want... Mean, I mean, If I'm, if I'm going to get one shot, I want it to be the heck of a shot. That's fair. If I only have one shot. Because it's not like yeah, you're going to no, be no, like... no, no, no. I didn't think about that. You're not going to be like running into the shot. trench and be like, thank God this is shorter. No, I want the bayonet at the end. Uh, yeah, you're not even getting a bayonet I'm with that. I'm not a bayonet. Yeah, so I'm going to take... I'm <laughs> gonna, that's not bayonet. Yeah, at least they get a spear out of mine. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah, no, I forgot there's no bayonet luck on this one. Yeah, no, I'll take that one. Yeah. Because they actually use those. <laughs> now, uh, that being said, uh, the Germans thought of this as an insurgent weapon, and that caused a lot of sorrow. Like, really, I mean, we're, we're kind of skimming it, but there's still arguments about the German behavior in Belgium and how far it really went, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of journalism at the time, but then versus the records. Like, to this day... I think we found in the series over and over again, people have a hard time quantifying what actually happened in the war because so much was recorded as fact Mm -hmm. and then never double check because it's on the other side of a war. How do you double check? The other guy's obviously lying. So Germany definitely did some killing in Belgium Mm -hmm. at a very minimum. And they were extremely harsh with the population. Generally at this time period, you don't always see, like, it's weird, but we're in this sort of, this hazy area of gentlemanly modern war where we have the Hague and everything, and you're supposed to not do these things when you occupy a region. Right. And the Germans are really agitated at the Belgians, in particular above others. And it's because they're terrified of franc terror. And this, to them, looks like that exact kind of thing. It is a single-shot, accurate beast of a rifle. I mean, it really is. Mm-hmm. It's shooting lead ammo, which is also in violation of the Hague. And they're just sort of, these civilian guys have them. You know what I mean? They also yep. have double barrel shotguns and other things that are driving them crazy too. And I, you can almost bet, like I've read reports where Germans have said that they definitely came under fire by some member of the Guard Civique. But then you turn it around and the Burgermeister or whatever the equivalent of is like, no, 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 that didn't happen. Like, it gets, both sides get debated back and forth. I've never, like, for the show, I couldn't find a hard example. I tried really hard to get Mm -hmm. a provable example. The Germans, however, it doesn't matter if it was ever proven. Because they still repeated it to each other. It became a fact to the German. 
that this well, gun eventually was... if it gets rumored enough well i mean it's it's so weird but we you see this all the time you it's the fog of war it's the fog of a crisis whatever it is you only know things by word of mouth back then there's no way to google it there's no way to wikipedia and fact check it there's no snopes or whatever, even if you trust that now. People argue about whether that's reliable. So think about it in that time, with even less data to go through. They just got to take the word of their buddy, who says that he heard it from some colonel, who heard it from whoever. And so, regardless, we're getting way down the weeds. This gun to the German was an insurgent sniper rifle, effectively. Like, not scoped or anything like that, but definitely, like, hide in a bush, hide in a building. There's stories of Germans... Uh, believing that there were front terrors in buildings and shooting the building up. That's true. Like, just being like, there, there's a guy in there and he's shooting. And somebody goes, what? And someone starts firing and they assume the shot came from the building. They just light up a building and there's literally no one in it. So this fear was there. Do you think it's warranted? Like, do you think that you could actually do, you know, as if you were laying up in the bushes, do you think you could knock somebody off from a good distance with this? I mean, I feel like... You've got the sight radius to be able to really narrow in your shots. Like I think you you can be fairly accurate with this guy if yep. you've got a steady if you've got a steady per, a steady place with it. Your but per, your performance was done standing. That's true. It was done standing you on a even, target that doesn't even have like it, it's essentially a a beige target on like white background right. with the woods behind it. So, I mean. And it's, it's not even like the best target to really focus down on to get the that like a highlighted target area, right? Okay. So, uh, you know, I'd argue 200 yards or so, 300 yards or so. I'd be curious to see that actually with, with the proper military ammo. I think I could it's do capable. some damage. I, I think I, it's capable. I, I think, think you just need to. I'd want to see somebody doing it though. I'd want the like someone like a, a nine hole. To oh, take yeah, that. That'd yeah, be great. Yeah. I'd love to the, see them do The it. problem is the condition on this gun. And then the this is another problem we run into is trying to make original enough ammo to get that performance. Oh, God. Yeah. But, no, I think it's warranted that Germany was afraid of this rifle. It's also warranted looking at it and compared to modern military rifles why the Belgians were like, what, that thing? Like, <laughs> you know, to them it was, it, by the way, it, it was always with the guard who were the guard. They're not the army. Mm -hmm. Like, that was with the army, but barely. So... When they see this, they think guard civic, who cares? And the Germans see it and they go, well, what are you doing with that? And it just causes this whole, like, it's just one it of those It doesn't keynotes. seem like it should. It really doesn't. Like, you look at it and you think there's there's not much to that, that what should warrant or gives me a sensation that it, it's going to be something that's, you know, yeah. to be feared. But and it's I yeah, think it this did. is at the heart of a cultural misunderstanding that caused real, like, cost real human lives during the war. Interesting history. Whether they were actually taken with this rifle or not. It cost real human lives. Mm. Okay, well, that's another interesting piece of history explored through the lens of one particular odd duck firearm. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody, for contributing this episode because this is a really wild one. Took a lot of work, and comm lanes are, are weird guns. Yeah, this episode took a whole lot of hands in it, so we appreciate all of your help. Yep. Uh, again, if you want to support the show, check out Patreon, subscribe, star, whatever is available at the time you're watching this, and then otherwise stay after the credits for an update. Uh, because that'll let you know what's fresh, because these get worked ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And then otherwise, May, do you have any final thoughts on these guys? Mm, not especially. I think we covered everything. It was a pr I, I'm actually I'm going to be sad to see the this black powder go, because I actually had a good bit of fun with it. Oh, I love the thump. Mm. All right, have a good one, y'all. Night, guys. All right, gang, this is really just a brief update. I already put together a larger one that covers a couple of topics. Uh, for those of you who are patrons or subscribed to our people, you could go listen to our great non-house fire of last week. But anyone that's kind of curious about the behind the scenes, that's available to the supporters of the show as a uh, private podcast. Um, if you're bored at home, don't forget we have our Discord that you can hang out on. Uh, I've had a lot of people writing me in, actually, uh, very sweetly telling me that because of sort of anxieties or other issues that are going on, they've enjoyed having the show as sort of a long format voice in the night kind of thing. And I completely understand that. There's a number of podcasts I consumed when I was having some medical issues a while back, 
it's it's oddly soothing and I agree and I'm I'm actually very flattered to be a part of that for someone else like some other shows were a part of that for me. Uh, I sincerely hope that what we're producing is helping sort of relieve some of the anxiety out there. And if it's not, I don't know why you're watching me. You can hit stop anytime you want. All right, have a good one.